There are multiple sexually transmitted infections, and a handful of those are not curable. Herpes is one of those. It's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving that you don't actually want. So in today's video, we're going to talk about why our bodies can't get rid of herpes, the different types, how you spread or contract herpes, and even some potential treatment options. And can you actually have herpes and not even know it? It's going to be a revealing one. So let's jump right into this anatomical awesomeness. Herpes is a viral infection that typically manifests on the skin as vesicular lesions. And a vesicular lesion or a vesicle is like a blister. And these will eventually ulcerate and even crust and scab over as healing occurs. Now herpes is caused by one of two different viruses, although there have been people that have contracted both. One is called herpes simplex virus type 1 or HSV1 and the other is called herpes simplex virus type 2 or HSV2. Now HSV1 is most often associated with sores around the mouth and the lips, often referred to as cold sores or fever blisters, whereas HSV2 is most often associated with sores around the genital structures and even the anus. But there is some potential crossover between these two viruses and that has to do with how you contract them. HSV1 is typically contracted or spread through direct contact with infected oral secretions from someone who has HSV1. And this is actually often done during childhood. Say like a parent or a sibling has a visible active lesion and this infected oral secretion gets transferred from say like kissing or sharing of other various items that eventually make it to the mouth. Now keep in mind you don't technically always have to have a visible lesion to spread HSV1 because there are some people who have these mild reactivations of this infection which we'll get to in a minute and they could potentially spread it. It's just that when they do have visible larger lesions, these lesions tend to shed more virus, have an increased viral load and therefore increase the risk of transmission. Now because of how HSV1 is typically spread like this through these infected oral secretions, it's not technically or generally classified as a sexually transmitted infection although there are some exceptions to this. However, HSV2 is typically classified as a sexually transmitted infection because again, it is most commonly transferred or contracted through direct contact of genital structures from an infected person. So let's cover one thing that many of you are probably thinking about. Is it possible to get HSV1 in the genital region as well as HSV2 around the mouth or the lips? And the answer is yes. Both virus types have been isolated from both genital lesions as well as oral lesions. It's just that more commonly, again, HSV1 is found around the mouth and HSV2 around the genital structures. Now, obviously, this transfer would occur through oral forms of intercourse. Say if somebody had an active infection or HSV1 around the mouth and they performed a form of oral intercourse, that could transfer HSV1 to the genital structure and vice versa is also true. If somebody had HSV2 in the genital region, it could get transferred to the mouth through oral forms of intercourse. So now we need to discuss why is herpes the gift that keeps on giving? Or in other words, why does our immune system have such a hard time completely eradicating this virus? Because those of you who've experienced herpes, like cold sores or other various manifestations of the infection, you may have got a pretty good idea that you can have flares where the lesions show up and then they heal and go away and then you can have another flare and there's a lot of variability on how often or how frequently people can experience these flares. And for us to understand how this is working, we need to talk about what's known as the primary infection and then how the virus kind of sets up in this latent kind of phase and then can actually reactivate periodically. So when a person is first exposed to the virus, the virus will infect epithelial cells. And epithelial cells make up the surface of your skin and even some of your mucous membranes, like a mucous membrane would be the inside lining of your mouth. But this virus will literally get inside these epithelial cells and start to replicate and copy itself. Next, and this is really important for our discussion, the virus will move into a sensory neuron that's close by or associated with that area of the skin or those epithelial cells. And once it moves into that sensory neuron, it's going to travel up the neuron towards something called a sensory ganglion. Now, I know ganglion is kind of a weird word, but just stick with me with this for a second, because the sensory ganglion is a collection of neuron cell bodies. And the cell body of a neuron is where you'd find like the nucleus and other organelles. Now, if this is an oral infection, it's going to set up in this ganglion called the trigeminal ganglion. Many of you may have heard of the trigeminal nerve. It's a great sensory nerve of the face. It serves many of the, much of the skin of the face. And if it's a genital infection, it will go into what's called a sacral ganglion. Now, the reason I'm bringing up this discussion about the ganglion 
is because this is where the virus kind of evades parts of our immune response and sets up this latent lifelong infection. And let me go back to the beginning of this process when the virus first gets into those epithelial cells. This is the start of what's known as the primary infection. And what's interesting about the primary infection is that many people are asymptomatic. But when people do have symptoms, that can include these painful vesicular lesions, swollen lymph nodes, and even things like a headache, fever, and even malaise, which is this term for just blah, I don't feel well. Now, when symptoms are present, they can start anywhere from 2 to 12 days after exposure. And if the vesicular lesions are present, those can last anywhere from 1 to 3 weeks, with the genital HSV lesions tending to last toward closer to that 2 to 3 week range. So what happens after our body deals with the primary infection? Well, this is when the latent phase of the infection starts, where that virus is kind of being contained within that sensory ganglion. Now, keep in mind that our body or our immune system, even though it can't fully eradicate the virus, it can deal with it to a certain degree. For example, our body heals and improves from that primary infection. And with the recurrent infections that we're about to talk about, people who have experienced those know that the lesions can come and then the body can heal. So our body does have this ability, especially from the perspective of the skin, to heal those skin lesions. And I kind of think of it as the immune system pushing the virus back up into that sensory ganglion, kind of containing it until a potential reactivation infection occurs. Now, when, how often, or how frequently these reactivation infections occur, and even if they occur, there's a variety of factors. Host factors like you, your own immune system, things that are within you that are unique to you have influenced that, as well as environmental factors. Some things that are thought to influence the reactivation of this virus are things like immunodeficiency, the immune system not working properly, stress, sunlight, and even a fever. That's why these are often referred to as like cold sores or fever blisters because people will notice that they pop up when they have a cold or even a fever. Now, when this reactivation phase occurs, the virus will re-enter its replication cycle and move back down that sensory neuron to the area of the skin that that sensory neuron serves and re-enter those epithelial cells and start to copy itself. And this is when the vesicular lesions will start to reform. Now, this process also explains why some people will experience what are called prodromal symptoms. And these are symptoms that can occur one to two days prior to the vesicular lesions or blisters actually forming. And these symptoms typically include things like pain, burning, tingling, and even itching in the pathway of that neuron prior to the lesions even forming. And let me reiterate something that I mentioned earlier. Again, the frequency and the severity of these reactivation infections or these flare-ups or outbreaks varies greatly among individuals. For example, I've had plenty of patients who have tested positive for HSV, especially HSV1, where they're like, I've never had a cold sore in my life. And I will say to them, well, you're probably one of those that were asymptomatic during the primary infection, or at least the primary infection was very mild and you probably didn't notice it much and you just kind of went on your way. And your body probably just does a, bitter, a better job containing that infection rather than allowing it to kind of have these flare-ups or outbreaks. Now, another thing that's interesting to consider is that the primary infection, in general, the severity of this tends to correlate with the frequency and the severity of the outbreaks. The worse the primary infection, the more severe and frequent the outbreaks or reactivation infections can be. Another thing that we want to consider is that HSV2, the genital infection of HSV2, is also much less forgiving. And what I mean by that is you are more likely to have outbreaks with HSV2 genital infections than you are, say, with like an oral HSV1 infection. So if we can't cure this or completely eradicate the virus, is there anything we can do for these reactivation infections or these flare-ups? And the answer is yes. For example, there are topical medications available that people will try to use. Most of these topical medications are ointments that help with the discomfort and the pain. Certainly topical lidocaine could help numb down that pain and make the flare a little bit more bearable. But the medications that tend to have the most data and be the most effective are a group of antiviral medications. And some of the common antiviral medications used for HSV are things like valacyclovir, acyclovir, and even famcyclovir. Now these medications are fairly accessible, generic, and fairly inexpensive and they tend to work if you use them properly, or at least they tend to help. Because they don't kill the virus, but what they do is help to slow down the replication of the virus. Because remember, during this reactivation infection or this flare, the virus is going to re-enter its replication cycle and start copying itself. So these medications can help inhibit that and kind of helps bolster the immune system to kind of push 
this virus back into its latent phase. And again, as I mentioned earlier, these medications need to be used correctly. And what I mean by that is when I have a patient who has, for example, these outbreaks, I'll say, you need to initiate these medications as soon as you feel the sores might be coming on. And my patients who do the best are those that recognize those prodromal symptoms that we mentioned earlier. Remember, sometimes people will notice that tingling, that burning, the pain before the sores will even form. And as soon as they feel those symptoms, initiate the medication because the medication again does not kill the virus it just inhibits its replication so if somebody already has the sores formed for like a day or two these antiviral medications won't do much but if they initiate them early enough what they'll notice is that the length of the outbreak the time they're experiencing the sores tends to shorten and even potentially helps with the severity and one other way I want to mention that these medications could potentially be used, and this would be reserved for people who have more severe and frequent outbreaks. A patient in this situation might opt with their healthcare provider to be on a lower dose or a lower maintenance dose, if you will. So they would be on a lower dose every single day in hopes that it could help reduce the chances or the risk of these frequent and more severe outbreaks. And of course, thanks for watching our videos, everyone. If you feel the need, like and subscribe. Leave some comments below. Let us know what you thought of the video and what you might want to see in the future. And of course, we'll see you next time.